Hi, my name is Melissa Bradley, and I'm so glad to see all of you here today on, depending on where you're sitting, a hot, humid, muggy, or rainy afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. I am proud to have you join us today in this fireside chat with Maxine Clark. As many of you may know, 1863 Ventures is committed to helping new majority entrepreneurs. We recognize that the historical disconnect and lack of support for marginalized entrepreneurs, particularly those of color, has caused tremendous drain on our economy, on local communities, and certainly shortened the amazing trajectory that could have happened if more entrepreneurs of color had been invested in. If you had a chance to read the city report, you know that $16 trillion was lost because of systemic racism in systems such as lack of access to banking, lack of access to venture capital. And thank goodness, over 400 plus years later, there is now a focus on this conversation. Well, for the past five years, New Voices, Ford Motor Company, you name it, uh, uh, her impact, many other companies have been working with us, Target, you name it, Ulta. And we're so proud that before COVID and before George Floyd, there were companies stepping up and really committed. And those commitments are driven because of leaders who decide this is important. This is an economic imperative to be able to help new majority entrepreneurs. It's really why I'm excited about today's conversation. As some of you know, we are a business development program helping entrepreneurs all across the country and even the globe grow and scale their businesses. We have a goal over the next 10 years to create $100 billion of new wealth by new majority entrepreneurs. We do that through our one-on-one -on -one training programs such as Recover, Rebuild, and Resilience that is training coupled with grants. We do that through our normal cohort program, Pipeline, and I see many of our Pipeline alumni in the audience, and thank you for joining us. We do that through our investment arm of 1863 Venture Fund. But most importantly, we do that through these kind of forums of town halls and fireside chats with amazing individuals who share our commitment, our passion, and our mission to support new majority entrepreneurs. Now, even though we're in this Zoom virtual world, things still require support. And if anybody's come through one of our programs, you know we say that people need capital, they need community, and they need coaches, and they need certainly cohort training. But out of that, that capital piece is not just financial dollars, it's social capital. And so I'm really thrilled about this conversation because the hope is to be able to learn and to extend your social capital to hear what does it take to grow and scale a business, particularly if you happen to be in the retail space. And I know many of you are. Obviously, this presentation could not happen without the entire team of 1863, who I'm deeply grateful to, but also without our partner in this, the Kaufman Foundation. And so I'm thrilled not only to just share with you and have you meet an amazing person, but someone that I'm proud to say has been my friend for many, many years. This is being sponsored by the Kaufman Foundation, and I'm thrilled to introduce you to Phil Gaskin. He is the Vice President of Entrepreneurship at the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, where he's responsible for leading the nation's and the foundation's comprehensive entrepreneurship portfolio. Now, I say that because Phil, even before getting to Kaufman, was a national leader in the space of ecosystem building for new majority entrepreneurs. In his portfolio, he's responsible for grant making, operating programs, convening, research, and policy. He is charged with leading a team of more than 30 associates in providing vision, strategic thinking and thought leadership to scale and deepen the impact of the foundation's entrepreneurship strategy. Now, this is not new to him because prior to taking on this role, he was the senior director of entrepreneurship at the foundation, where he actually led the strategic implementation and execution of the Kaufman entrepreneurship strategy across entrepreneurial learning, ecosystems, entrepreneurship organizations, policy, research programs, and initiatives. And if you didn't know, he also was the leading advocate for the Capital Access Lab, which not only helped entrepreneurs, but recognized there was a role to support general partners who wanted to invest in these entrepreneurs. So I'm truly privileged to introduce you to Phil Gaskin, a leader, an ecosystem builder, and a friend. Phil, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Sorry, can't see you, everyone. We will all be in person one day soon. I am just thrilled to thrilled to be here and be part of this effort. And Melissa, thanks for that introduction. And been coughing about four and a half years and running a you know systems change based strategy that is about looking at what are the systemic barriers that get in the way of entrepreneurs starting and growing businesses on a daily basis, especially for underrepresented populations, women, people of color, rural environments, etc. Um, and I see this as this is an economic game, right? So this is a numbers game. So the new majority, and if we look at where half of the country will be, 
an X number of years population wise was made up of women and people of color, you know, the groups that are struggling the most in having and being able to have access to opportunity funding, support and knowledge to start and grow businesses. So those businesses have to, to have to start and grow, employ people to put more people into the economy and revenue into the economy. So this is a United States economic economy viability and sustainability conversation. At the end of the day, groups now, who's going to buy your product product in the future? It's going to have to be the new majority. It's going to have to be um, these populations that are struggling so, so much. So I wake up every day knowing that. I wake up every day passionate about solving solving those barriers. So um, and in reducing the, all those barriers, and when it comes to capital, it's just so pervasive ac across so many different planes and cross cuts and cross tabs. And so I'm really happy to be part of this. I be believe this conversation today is going to be fan fantastic. It's it's timely. It's the right conversation. And um, I uh, Kaufman is is has all of it, supports all of you any way we possibly can. And um, you can always go through Melissa if you need to if you need to find me and reach out to me. So have a have a fantastic session. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Phil. We truly appreciate your support and feel free to reach out. Phil does always respond. So I am grateful for that. I, I am so excited about uh, this conversation that we're going to have with Maxine. And, and let me tell you why. Um, not just because she's a very, very, very successful entrepreneur. Uh, not just because on the complete humble, she took an intro and we had an amazing call. Uh, but because this conversation is so important, particularly for what we call new majority founders. While there are amazing tech firms and lots of ventures out there, there is an inordinate amount of focus on tech, which I love, and we all should be tech enabled. But the reality is less than 20% of all black businesses are in the tech space. And so we at 1863 really find it important to support all entrepreneurs, but recognize that historically 80% of our community has been overlooked with this outweighed focus on technology. We know tech is important. We know it's great, but you know what? It is just as hard building a business in the retail space. And we want to make sure that you all understand how to de-risk your businesses, how to reduce friction, how to grow and scale. And so I cannot think of a better person. I am humbled and honored to introduce you to Maxine Clark, who is the founder of Build-A-Bear Workshop. And, and I don't know, I can't imagine there's anybody who has not been to a Build-A-Bear. Uh, we have six kids. And when I first talked to Maxine, I was like, I think we have bought over a thousand bears. In oh my somewhere in the basement. We still have them. So, but if you don't know, Build-A-Bear is a teddy bear themed retail entertainment experience. And that it is. I was blown away the first time said, take the heart, kiss it and make a wish. And I was like, whoa, you, you've got and locked in my kids. But in 1996, Maxine left her long and successful career in retail with the May department stores and her role as president of Payless Shoe Source to start her own business focused on engaging children through the idea of what was not yet specific. After an unsuccessful trip to a local toy store with her 10-year-old best friend, Katie, to buy a beanie baby, the idea for Build-A-Bear was born. We can make these, declared Katie. And nine months later, the first store opened in St. Louis, Missouri. And if you don't know, a generation of makers began. Today, there are over 400 Build-A-Bear workshop stores worldwide. Nearly 200 million stuffed animals have been sold. That's a lot of stuffed animals. Maxine stepped down from her chief executive bear role in 2013 to start her next act, which is to help unleash the potential of women and new majority entrepreneurs to use her entrepreneurial skills to create platforms and places that give access to more St. Louis families. And dare I say now, even beyond. Her latest venture is the Del Mar Divine, the transformation of a neighborhood eyesore, the historic St. Luke's Hospital, into a multi-use real estate development to open later this year. She is also the founding managing director of Prosper Women's Capital, a St. Louis-based accelerator for women-led businesses. She's the board of advisors of Lewis and Clark Ventures and an advisor to the TXO Fund. She's a member of the Build-A-Bear Workshop on the board. She's also on the board of Foot Locker and Big Dot and also the Happiness Board of, I'm sorry, Big Dot of Happiness Board of Directors. I'm going to ask her about that one. She's also a member of the Washington University Board of Trustees and the New America Parent is Teachers and PBS National Boards. In 2017, 
2017, she was named to the Missouri Public Affairs Hall of Fame and in 2015 was named Woman of the Year by the Greater Missouri Leadership Foundation. Most importantly, she holds an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from St. Louis University and much like myself, she spends time giving back and teaching students at all levels on how they too can build successful careers, give back and be great entrepreneurs. And in 2006, she published her first book, I look forward to many more, called The Bare Necessities of Business, Building a Company with Heart. So Maxine, thank you so much uh, for joining us. You're welcome. I don't know if you can see, yeah, I guess you can yes. see me now. Great, yes. great. Awesome. Uh, yeah, it's great to see you again and to be in uh, conversation with you and the group. So thank you very much. Yeah, well, we're excited. And, and I don't know if you can see the chat, but we've got several people shouting out uh, St. Louis. Yes, I did see that. I'm so happy to see that. And happy to see that there are customers in the group because it gives you a little bit of feeling for who we are and how we got there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I said a lot in that bio and we all have these amazing bios, but let's just cut to the brass tacks and tell us a little bit about your journey to become an entrepreneur. Because I think myself, we've talked about this, people on this call know it is more than a notion just to come up with an idea and actually start a business. So share a little about your progress and your trajectory. Mm -hmm. I don't think that I actually ever thought about specifically being an entrepreneur. I went to, you know, grew up in Miami, Florida. I had a, you know, very middle class, lower middle class upbringing, went to public school my whole life, went off to college um, in the six, in the late sixties, intending to be a civil rights attorney. That's what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I went to Washington, DC to go to law school and I had to go to work to pay for law school. So I went to work at the department store in the, in town called the Heck Company, which was a part of the May department stores. And just a few weeks into my job, my boss, um, who knew I was working to go to law school and everything, he got sick and they needed me to fill in for him. And so I had to take a leave of absence from law school, which I'm still on today, by the way. Uh, I got in order to do the job that I was required to do, I was you know, 22 years old, I just out of college, I didn't know um, by anything about this. And the good news was all of the vendors and the people in this department, it was a big sportswear department, wanted to be sure that when Harry came back, he was successful, that he had made his bonus and they wanted to help me through the process. So they taught me so much. And because I was the beginning of the really working woman trend and I was one of those working women, I was able to really influence our assortment because there was nothing there I wanted to buy, actually. And I knew what I needed. I had needed everything, you know, came from college, uh, short skirts and, you know, uh, knee high socks and all that good stuff. And I needed to have real clothes. So we started bringing those things into the department and they kept selling like crazy. And Harry came back to a big bonus and I got promoted. And I realized during that time that I actually love this business. I love creating products and, and the customer being on the floor, on the selling floor of the customer. And that I was actually had very entrepreneurial instincts. Like I was, you know, even though it was somebody else's money that I was using, I was constantly reinvent, reinventing the wheel, which you get to do in the fashion business because every season is a new season. And luckily for me, um, the CEO of the company who was located in St. Louis um, got word of how successful I had been just as a college, you know, graduate and called me up and wanted to know how I did it and what did I do. And um, a few months later, I was asked to be, well, I was promoted to come to St. Louis and to um, work for him um, on the corporate staff, which I got to do a lot of things I would never have gotten to do. Um, I got to um, do a um, work on acquisitions, work with the key vendors. And all of those things required because we were growing our business. That was the, the heyday of the, the 70s. We were growing the retail business like crazy. And I got to be part of all of those, even though I wasn't necessarily the buyer of those departments, I got to influence the buying decisions of the company. And that was a really, uh, and I met a lot of entrepreneurs. I met um, Leonard Lauder. I met people who started other companies. And I got to see there's lots of people that have started their own companies. I didn't meet that many women until I went to actually Asia. And when I started going to buy merchandise in China, I got to see that women that own factories that were running the factories, especially in Taiwan, uh, lots of women. And they really, they took to me because here I was a woman buyer coming over there. And so it was really outside of America that I got to see there were other women business owners uh, in companies st starting from scratch, basically. And many of those women are still my friends today. Well, that is awesome. And and I have to say, I, I, I was sitting, I was like, darn, she could have been in DC if she hadn't been taken away to St. Mm -hmm. Louis. Because you talk about the heck company. I mean, those are all anchor institutions here in DC. So so being place is everything. So having seen that experience and certainly coming out of clothing, why build a bear? Why a bear? 
Well, um, one of the jobs that I, I was promoted to in the make company was uh, Payless Shoe Source. I was the president of Payless Shoe Source and the make company owned Payless then. And for me, it was important because I was on the acquisition team. So I felt like it was my family business. Um, so when I went there to Topeka, Kansas, which I wouldn't necessarily highly recommend, uh, no offense to Phil and people that live in Kansas City, that's a much different world. But I went to Topeka, Kansas and I ran the company for four years and I loved it. But when the make company decided to spin it off, I saw that I had a, a uh, an opportunity uh, to uh, take my money and run, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I could start my own business. I had no idea what it was. I knew though it would be for children. And I thought it would be in education and involve technology. Mm -hmm. In fact, I made several trips to, to Kansas City to the Kaufman uh, uh, Center uh, to talk with people there because they were so engaged in educational endeavors and, and entrepreneurial endeavors as well. Uh, and I had a couple of really good ideas. But one day, I was um, take, I picked up my next door neighbor kids from a uh, school at, at doing my my uh, next door neighbor a favor, and we stopped on at a store in our neighborhood that was selling Beanie Babies. If you remember the Beanie Baby trend, I do and they still had a big sign in the window that said, um, "We have Beanie Babies," but when we walked in, they didn't have any. And mm -hmm. Katie was really kind of mad because you know the parents used to troll the stores for them, and she didn't like that. So she said, "You know, these are so easy. We could make these." Mm. Well, she meant go home and do a craft project in my basement, but I had a Willy, literally a Willy Wonka explosion in my head. And I saw this store because I'd seen machines were made stuffed animals in the stuffing machine. I saw how we could create this kind of field trip in a local mall where kids could come and make their own stuffed animals. And literally I, I went on the, we got home. She went downstairs to get out the craft supplies. And I went to my computer and Netscape, if you remember how slow all that was, and looked for factories I could where I could buy that I could turn into this idea that I had. Because lots of venture capital people were advising me, even though they wouldn't have invested in me, they advised me to find a company I could buy and have that as collateral and a team of people that could help me, although I had 25 years of really good experience. But I looked, I thought that's a good idea. Couldn't, couldn't convince anybody, found a couple, couldn't convince anybody to sell to me. And when I told Katie, she said, well, why don't we do it? And had she said nothing or I hadn't even talked to her, I'm not sure what I would have done. But when she was so engaged with me, um, I started Build-A-Bear. And nine months later, we opened our first store in the St. Louis Galleria. I knew how to do this. I just didn't have the all the ingredients in my head, you know, kind of working it out uh, until I got kids on my board of directors. My first board of directors was children. Wow. And uh, we had about 15 kids. Uh, they were my friends' kids, neighborhood kids. They brought kids. Um, and they all kind of advised me and told me what kind of animals would sell. That's, it's called Build-A-Bear Workshop, but we had more than bears, even right. from the beginning. And right. uh, it was those kids that really helped me make not, very, not any big mistakes, that's for sure. Well, and I think what was also cool as a parent, um, I loved it while I was there because it was a great way to, like, at some point I could drop the kids and then go come back. But then, of course, I realized when I would go to the mall without them, the week, I need a new outfit. I need some clothes. And so I think what was amazing was it wasn't just the bears, but you figured out how to create a repeatable business. Even if I only bought one bear, of course, no one ever walked into the stores and bought one bear and somebody just stopped, even the birth certificates. So how did all that come about? Because I think yeah. in retail, right, it's all about how do you get repeat customers for something like a bear that, you know, I have to admit yours never fell apart. So how did that come about? Yeah, we, well, really, I, you know, I let the child in me come out. And when I was around children, and I'm only about four foot 10, so I'm their same height. So we could see eye to eye. I, and I really, what I really did, like what most entrepreneurs do, is you create a canvas for other people to participate. So many of the ideas, like uh, the summer before we opened, I was brought at a friend's house for a, a barbecue, and I brought the bears in a duffel bag, and I was showing it to one of my friends who's an artist, and she came up with the idea for the heart. She says, oh, you have to put a heart in the bear. And immediately, I went home that night, and I emailed the factory, and I bought um, hearts. And then um, that was just one thing. But then when we opened up, I, one of our sales associates who was a teacher and worked part-time for us, I came to the store one afternoon about one week or two weeks after we opened, and he was creating this ceremony that put your, put the heart in your bear. I had never even thought of that. No. And I saw how people were putting in two or three or four or five hearts in a bear because there was a whole family there together. And I saw what he added to our company, tremendous value. I mean, I couldn't have thought of that without his help. And then, of course, by the time we opened up multiple stores, every single associate that worked at the stuffing machine, and that was everybody, um, was putting their own personality into it, their own dreams and wishes that mm -hmm. they would want their children or their grandchildren to experience. So really, you know, that made my life so much easier when I realized that it wasn't all up to me. Really, everybody could participate. And I think that's really what a great business does. It makes it possible to evolve 
with the ideas of your team. And um, that's what I learned. I, when I think back to my very first experience that I told you about, mm-hmm. I was learning from the, the vendors and the suppliers and the salespeople on my floor. They wanted me to be successful. And so they taught me everything they know. And they knew, and I was a sponge just, you know, taking it up and I'm still that sponge. I have a lot of curiosity. I think that's one of the very um, important skills of an entrepreneur is yep. to be, you know, and I immerse myself in the business. I, I probably could tell you everything about a teddy bear within six months of starting the company that ever existed, including, you know, the history of the teddy bear. And, you know, when I b- did my business plan, I knew that Teddy Roosevelt had been the inspiration for the teddy bear and that he had invented that teddy bear in 1902 or so. I mean, he had inspired that. And so when we o- opened up our hundredth store, it was the honor in, on the anniversary of the hundredth year of the teddy bear. And it was at Roosevelt Field in Long Island in New York. So I had it all planned out and I kind of orchestrated it. That that was one of my goals, even though when I started with store one, I didn't have a contract for store 100 yet. <laughs> but I had a plan. I had a plan. And I, I tell every young entrepreneur, the reason you write a plan, and nowadays sometimes they're just PowerPoints, but the really good ones are plans, is to convince yourself it's the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. That it's something you, you got to sell yourself first on this is going to be your life's work or your near-term life's work. And if you can't sell yourself, then you can't sell a bank and you can't sell investors and you can't sell associates to come to work for you. So a detailed plan is, uh, you know, it's a work in progress, but it helps you um, get going. I'm I'm so glad you said that because as a professor, I always get everybody with these like flashy PowerPoints. I'm like, that's great, but it doesn't really tell me what the business is going to do. And to your point, because you relied in in the best way possible on others to help grow the business with you, the roadmap was there. They weren't trying to decipher what did you mean on slide number seven, which I think happens happens so often. When you and I first talked, you were very clear to say that Build a Bear was a social mission and social impact company. Talk a little bit about that. What yeah. does it mean to you? Well, you know, I wanted to our company to make a difference. I knew that it would make a difference for children as they came into our store and bought something. Um, and it, and I wanted to always keep it affordable. Mm. Um, that was really important to me because, of course, that's relative. You know, what ten dollars might be inexpensive for a bear to somebody, but to somebody else, it might as well be a million dollars. But we knew that that it was a, a price point that most people could afford. And when I did my research early in, in the in the schools here around in St. Louis. Um, kids that lived in the poor neighborhoods didn't even have a teddy bear. They didn't even know what I was talking about. Wow. Um, but today, when I go to those same schools, they bring their teddy bears to show me the teddy bear that they made because we made it accessible. We reached out to people. We brought people to the stores. We went to schools. We created sort of mini workshops where kids could dress their bear. I remember teaching a math class um, as part of Teach for America where we measured the bears to design clothing for them. Uh, it was all measurements and kids were really getting into it. And I think that like, this is pretty easy. We should be using these in classrooms all across the country uh, to teach kids different things at different ages. These were little uh, third, fourth graders, but they were into it. And they, they understood their measurements pretty darn well after we finished that class. And, th- and the teacher was a male teacher. He got into it. He was really, it was great. So I saw that this was a possibility that we could even do more um, from the beginning. And when we created the Build-A-Bear Foundation pretty early uh, in our company, um, we designed animals that would be giving back all the time um, mm. from the, almost the maybe the second year we were in business that an, when a customer bought that animal, a portion of the proceeds of that animal went to a cause like the World Wildlife Foundation, um, the uh, uh, dog rescue and animal rescue, uh, children's health, literacy, all kinds of things. And we gave, we actually, with the help of our customers have given millions and millions of dollars to really important work in our country. And uh, and our 25th, an- 25th anniversary coming up next year, we're working on um, something that's still really, 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 really important to me, which is literacy. I feel like we could make a huge dent if, if we put our efforts behind maybe one thing um, that could really empower children in ways we haven't even imagined yet. Because if you can read, you can go. And that's what I was, an avid reader. I My parents couldn't afford to go. I never even went on an airplane until I went away to college. And I... Um, I have seen the world through books and I have a great imagination and the books they make for children today are far better than the books they made when I was a little kid. Um, So I'm really excited about about, um, how we can influence really good decisions that families make about making bears. One thing for sure I know we've done is we've created a generation of makers. Very few children wanna go to a store and buy a stuffed animal off the shelf. 
they want to make it. And now they're entrepreneurs themselves. And they, I get letters from kids that tell me when I went to build a bear, I, I knew I wanted to invent a business like build a bear and they didn't mean another teddy bear business, although I would welcome them uh, to do it. I just hope they wouldn't, but, but they have come up with so many great businesses and, I think I mentioned to you also that I spend a good percent of my time now um, on that Del Mar Divine project that we can talk about, but also investing in in time and a small amount of money, um, really relative to what it takes to run a business in women and minority entrepreneurs, because I knew how hard it was for me um, to even get a bank loan. My husband, even though I'd run a a multi-billion dollar company, I had to get my husband to co-sign on a loan. And I just said, I'm not going to worry about it. Just let him do it. You know, you know, he's not running the business. I am, and I've just got to get this going. And eventually they'll, they'll sign it over to me, but actually they didn't. And um, even up to the time where a public company, um, I had to take the canceled checks that I wrote to the California teachers credit union um, because they were one of the owners of the building where we were and show them that they'd been cashing my checks for, for uh, eight years or seven years and my money was apparently pretty good. And they agreed that they had to now write it. Oh, let me be the owner on the lease of the building. So um, it just things like that, that just drive me crazy. So now I, I get to advise people. Um, I don't have to do the hard work. I get to be the, you know, helping them see through some of the pitfalls, uh, the, the scaling issues of scale and issues of, of knowing when you need the money. You don't need all the money at first. You need what, what you need. How do you plan what you need? And you're ahead of it rather than behind it. And that's not easy. That's because sometimes businesses like this past year, many of these businesses have grown exponentially, right. um, especially the black owned businesses, because they've created some products that were in high demand and they needed to scale to get more products out there to do more business. Uh, so that's been challenging because uh, the growth came faster than anybody could have expected, uh, which is a good thing, but it's also a challenging thing. And fortunately now we have a lot of black led uh, private equity firms uh, that are, you know, looking to invest in these. And some are in the seed, early seed stage. Some are more in the venture capital uh, stage, and some are obviously in the um, later stage. But we're getting there um, for women and minorities in a, in a way that didn't exist when I started Build a Bear for sure. Yeah, and, and that, wow, there, there's so much in that. So I, I want and people are sending in questions. So I want to get those. Um, but let's start with just current day, right? I mean, obviously, COVID changed everything. So. You know, we didn't have COVID, but there were clearly ebbs and flows during the time when you were leading and running Build-A-Bear. What are some best sales strategies? Let's get into some tactics here that entrepreneurs can think about in times of COVID. I mean, one was, to your point, like really getting the customers involved. But what are some of those other lessons that you had as, as a big company in a consumer space who really had to relate to who your customers were, which was kids, and then you had to convince us parents to actually pay for it? Mm-hmm. Well, the first thing, this can't be overstated. You must be connected to your customers. And when we started Build-A-Bear, the good news about it in 1997, when we opened up our first store, was that we didn't need, we could, there were systems out there that we could just plug and play. And we started with a fresh plate. We didn't have all these old fashioned systems. So we were able to start early. And if, if you know that when you come to Build-A-Bear, you make a birth certificate. That was an idea that um, I had because I loved, I was a merchant, I merchandised toys and I sold millions of Cabbage Patch dolls. And remember, if you remember those, they all had a birth certificate. That's right. You didn't get to decide their name right. and you or their date of birth. It was all pre minute but everyone loved those. And so I said, we're going to make birth certificates for our bears, but I want them to be trackable because when I was 10 years old, I almost, I lost my teddy bear and I never found it again. And so we created this barcode system that goes inside every bear. And when you put that in there and you take it over to our namey computer where we'll print a birth certificate for you. You also gave us information and permission to contact you if that bear was lost or stolen. And we built a database very, very quickly where we could reach our customers. We could send them a birthday card. We could re- remember that their bear was born on that day too, or the bear birthday. So we sent cards to bears for their birthday or cows or frogs or bunny rabbits. They all got a birthday note from us. And then we, um, but as the, as uh, the, the COPA rules change and as privacy rules change, that became harder and harder to do, but we built this pretty big information uh, base and everybody had a personalized teddy bear with a name it's of its own. Uh, and that was, and kids were so creative. I mean, back in the day of, um, I remember the World Series was going on and we had um, Mark McGuire in St. Louis versus Sammy Sosa in Chicago for home run kings. 
and there were so many Sammies and Mark Bears made during that time. You know, kids are just, they're just paying attention to what's going on in the world. And they've followed the trends. When Hannah Montana was hot, we had a lot of Hannahs yes. and we had a lot of Montanas. So, you know, there, but as we added more properties that were licensed, we found that kids named them that same name. They didn't come up with a new name and I wanted them to stay creative. So we always had a balance of that. Um, but so staying connected to your customer is everything. And our customer was the, the child and the parent. Uh, the other is the trends, you know, what, what's going on around you and how can you, when, when uh, those uh, skateboards came, those, um, they were bikes, like a one, you know, I forget what they called them, but we made one like this. Yeah, like a unicycle. We made them for bears. When we, when uh, lighted sneakers were hot, we made lighted sneakers for bears. Um, I have a great story that my friends from um, Skechers, who I knew from the shoe business, saw a build a bear store and they said, "Why don't you have it was you know, why don't you make Skechers shoes for bears?" And I said, "You guys are going to charge me a fortune." And they said, "Try us." And they said, "Let's do it for free for a year and let's see, and then we'll decide how much it is." And wow. kids wanted to dress like their bears, so they bought the matching Skechers shoes and they didn't charge us an arm and a leg and we were able to sell millions and millions of Skechers for children and Skechers for bears. And I used to say that you can never have too many shoes. And now I say you can never have too many teddy bears and now teddy bears have shoes. So all those things came from our customers, came from our vendors. I mean, he was a customer in our store and he saw what we were doing and he said, they should have Skechers. And I think everybody felt very positively about Build-A-Bear. So they wanted to give me, uh, they wanted to participate with us. Yep. Uh, very few people um, would say no to us, you know, like they, they, they just wanted to be a part of the, of the joy we were bringing into families' lives. Our cub condo, the box that our bears come in, that wasn't really um, a, a brilliant idea, except that when my vendor from China came to visit me before we opened our store, he loved bagels. And so he went to Einstein Bagels and he bought one of those big containers of bagels. Yes. And it was sitting on the desk in, in the room that we're in. And I said, boy, that's the exact size of a bear. And I took all the bagels out and I put a bear in it and it fit perfectly. So I, I sent it to our brand designer and I said, we need to come up with a box that works for us. And that's how the cub condo was invented, but it was really like a happy meal box or a bagel box. But those ideas are sitting in front of you all the time and they're adaptable. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. I didn't invent um, teddy bears. Ray Kroc didn't invent hamburgers. Howard right. Schultz didn't invent coffee. And, you know, Casper didn't invent beds, you know, but you can invent a new way uh, to make things more comfortable, more desirable, more uh, accessible, uh, more affordable. All those ways are possible. And so it's but maybe invented, but it, it's not perfected. And that's really what you're after is something that's better than the last time somebody put it on the market. A perfect case study in, in innovation. Uh, and, and obviously we know, right, that innovation does not happen without money. Um, so you shared a little bit that your husband was your first investor, I guess your friends and family round. Tell a little bit, did you, I mean, to me, you've always been successful. So what was your fundraising journey like? Well, it's not a typical story. Actually, my husband, um, he just let me have a, a place in his office, you know, like that was his first contribution our, and our money was all pulled together, but I worked hard and I made a good living and I'd saved up my money and I had quite a nest egg for my May company stock. So I wasn't really worried about the first few stores. And I wanted it to be everything I'd ever dreamt a store could be. So that Willy Wonka got translated into the first Build-A-Bear store. And I, um, we had one of a kind, lots of one of a kind fixtures. But about in July, before we opened in October, there was an article in the St. Louis Business Journal. And the reason I, I tell this story is because it's really important to be willing to share your story. Somebody maybe can copy the idea, but they can't copy your heart. Right. They can't copy the soul of the business. And nobody had seen our story yet. But he called me, uh, one of the local investors called me up on the phone and he said, you don't know me, but my name is Barney Ebsworth and I'm a businessman here in town. I read the article and I'd like to meet you. And uh, he was an entrepreneur himself. And I went over to meet him. On, he said, you got to come on Monday because I'm leaving on Tuesday. I go to Seattle for the summer. And I went over to meet him and we had about a half hour conversation. He says, how much money do you need? And I said, well, you know, for the next four or five you know, years, I'll probably need like, you know, maybe five million, four and a half, five million. And four million, five million, I said. And he said, is next Thursday soon enough? Wow. Well, it wasn't not quite next Thursday. The next question he asked was, what would you, what would I get for my four and a half million? So he'd come in the middle of that number. So always shoot higher, you know, maybe if I'd said 10, I would have gotten more. I didn't really need more, but he said, um, I'd be happy. I don't want to run the business. I want you to run. It. I'd be happy with 20%. So that set our valuation, which valuation is one of those hardest things to teach anyone. I don't think there's a rule about it, really. 
uh, in a small startup or a company without revenue or with small revenue, what the potential is. Um, so he really did set the, you know, the pace. And of course I put my own money in and then the, the, there are already people calling me that heard about it, but we hadn't opened yet. We opened um, in October of 1997 and two weeks later was um, Washington University is in St. Louis. And two weeks later was, was parents weekend. And all the parents take their kids to the mall to go get whatever it is they need. And the lines were out the door. And literally people were throwing me their business cards, you know, <laughs> call me, call me, call me. Some people, I heard them in line saying, oh, this is a Disney company, which was a, certainly the ultimate, you know, compliment. Um, and we, we had a lot of people looking to invest in us, but I didn't need their money. Yeah. And so I could, I could say no. Um, and I said, but I'll keep you in mind. And um, one investor, uh, he made, when we, a year later, we did need some money. He made an offer that was totally ridiculous. I said, no. Um, two years later, he was an investor at, at my price. Um, we had investors from the Midwest, um, from Cincinnati. I didn't have a friends and family round till the very end, right before we went public, because I didn't really want to spend all my time talking to my friends about my business. And if things weren't right, I didn't need to go that route. So I didn't have to. And they were kind of mad at me, but they put their money in and they made a lot of money when we went public. And so the um, so I was very fortunate. You know, yeah. that was a really an unusual story. Um, and I was also 48 years old when I started Build-A-Bear. So that's an important comment because I wasn't 22 years old without, you know, a reputation. People knew me, uh, people in the May company, they didn't, um, I wouldn't let anybody invest from yet, but they were giving me resources. You know, they were talking to me about transportation resources and all kinds of things that mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily know even by osmosis. So it really worked out 48 years. Uh, I see somebody just wrote it was young. It yes. really was young. I was at the peak of my. Um, my working life, I had more energy than I could have even imagined. And I, I think, think you have even more now, Maxine. I'd have to say, I think you have even more right now. Yeah, maybe. I, I get a lot of energy from all the companies that I work with. Every day is a new experience. And I love that. That's what they've, they've really fueled that for me. But I, I really feel like for me, it's not right for everyone. All that experience that I had garnered was necessary for me to realize I was truly an entrepreneur. That's not right for everyone. Um, everybody, some people can start much younger um, and with far less, um, you know, experience, but yeah. I do recommend experience. If you want to own a restaurant, a chain of restaurants, go work for one and go learn what you like and you don't like, because what I learned from a lot of my bosses was exactly what I wanted to be as a leader mm. and what I didn't want to be as a leader. Yeah. And if I hadn't worked for them, I wouldn't know what to, what's good and what's bad. So you need some perspective. So I spent those 25 years in a great company um, earning a good salary, saving my money, and l learning a lot from the leaders that I work for. Yeah. So I, I have two more questions. I'm going to pull some from the audience, and then I want to make sure before time runs out, we talk about the amazing stuff you're doing in, in St. Louis right now. Um, so I'm going to try to combine these. Um, what if you could, if you could advise your younger self to do one thing uh, different in your business, what would it be? Uh, and I'm going to say, and, and it, did you ever, like, did anybody ever tell you something and then you felt like, oh, that was the best advice or they told it and you ignored it and you wish, oh, I wish I had done that. Well, sometimes when somebody tells you not to do something, it's really good advice. So I'll tell you about that one. But the, um, the best advice I would give myself is that um, the best is always still yet to come. Mm. That, you know, when you, when you think you've arrived, there's so much more in front of you, more, more of the journey. And the journey is the best part of the destination. Um, so much better. I mean, I, I would, I think I would have been a good attorney. I think I would have been a great civil rights attorney, but I get to get engaged in civil rights in a different way as a business person advocating for, for uh, people who need to be advocated for, who deserve to have advocacy um, and are brilliant. And as a business person, I get a little bit extra credibility for that because I, I know something that they don't know and it brings a lot to the table. But I will say that I did have a, one of my, um, I thought he was gonna invest, but he didn't end up investing. But he told me that when I showed him the box and I showed him everything, he says, oh, you don't need that box. Just get a, get a bag, the bag, you know, don't spend all that money on the box. And when I went to price the bag, the bag was more expensive than the box. Wow. So, so I had, I was going to use the box anyway, because I, again, it was my happy meal. I, and this bagel box all combined in one. Uh, but he told me something and he made me think about it. And I learned that, you know, sometimes the thing that looks the cheapest is more expensive. Right. And so, so if you're going to, I, I tell all my entrepreneurs, put every idea, your best ideas, the dream supreme in that business plan. That doesn't mean you can do it all at first. But then at least you know what it is, because if you put all your good ideas out there for the customer 
yep. and it doesn't succeed, then you'll know you put everything into it. But if you start to cut and say, no, I can't afford that, or I can't afford this, or I can't, you, you might miss something that would have really turned the business on and you'll never know. And I had the luxury of being able to do that. Um, but I, I also took all the ideas my friends gave me because I wasn't afraid to share my idea with them. And once I shared it, they gave me a lot more um, input. And that was really helpful. I, I love that. Um, somebody asked a question about competition. I have to admit, I mean, I've been, I've got six kids, so I've been to a heck of a lot of toy stores, but none have had the experience of Build-A-Bear. And so how did you think about competition at the beginning? And let's be clear, I mean, Build-A-Bear is still going strong. So like that says something, you talked about customers, but talk about competition yeah. and how did you look at that? Yeah, again, that's back to putting everything I knew into the business and everything good quality. And, and most people that tried to copy us, uh, and I'll t- I have a funny story to tell about that, they made it more expensive, but they didn't look more expensive. They weren't higher quality. They couldn't use the heart because we trademarked that. And when we found that people that were trying to use it, we took them you know, to test on it. We had a lot of people trying to copy us, but, but um, nobody did it with the heart and soul that we had. And so they really weren't successful. But one great story, I was in um, uh, uh, Pit, uh, Philadelphia looking for um, another store site. And I went to this mall. Um, not, we were at, we were at King of Prussia mall, a great mall. We went to this other mall and there was a kiosk that was selling, um, make your own stuffed animals. And it said build a bear on it. And, um, I thought that's really interesting. So I went up to the guy and I was talking to him and I said, I just came from King of Prussia and I saw build a bear there. And he said, Oh, that's different. That's our more expensive version. And I said, really? And I said, why would they have you selling a less? He said, well, this mall is, is not as good as that mall. So we kept to sell things cheaper. I said, but you aren't cheaper. You're more expensive. And he, he realized that I might be somebody who knew a little more about it. I said, well, thank you. It's nice to meet you. And I gave him my business card, which said I was the founder of Build-A-Bear Workshop. And I went to the mall office and I talked to them about it and that they were no longer selling in the mall. I mean, I don't know why he didn't know the, ma- the mall owner knew that wasn't Build-A-Bear, but we, we really did, you know, when you, when you um, create intellectual property, that's one thing, it's expensive, but you've got to be willing to defend it. And we, we were willing to defend it. I was maniacal about it. If I heard about a competitor, I would get on a plane and go. It didn't mean that I thought that they were, if they, I, I wasn't against competition. I was against people copying our intellectual property. But lo and behold, some of those companies that what I thought would be good competition just didn't have the heart to, to see it through. And I did. Yeah. And, and I think the, the, the piece around tenacity is important. So before we went out of time, um, talk about what you're doing in St. Louis. Yeah. Oh, well, um, luckily, uh, Build-A-Bear was a successful company and we were able to, when we took the company public, realize um, our investment, our personal investment many times over. And we put it into a foundation with my intention of uh, giving back to the community of St. Louis in different ways, particularly St. Louis. Not We do things all around the country. But um, one day I was working on our charter school, our KIPP charter school, and I turned right instead of left. And I came by this old hospital building in this um, neighborhood in St. Louis that is um, the dividing line of rich and poor and black and white. It's called the Del Mar Divide on Del Mar Boulevard. And everything north is a uh, low end and black and uh, black neighborhood and um, manufacturing and everything on the south side is white and richer and um, not commercial, not, not manufacturing. Uh, totally neighborhoods though with absolutely magnificent homes, once magnificent homes, beautiful neighborhoods that had been uh, not in, had been disinvested in. And so I um, turned around and I saw this building for sale and I said, what are they going to do with this? We just opened a school with 600 kids in it. What are we going to do with this building? It's going to destroy the neighborhood. And I called up the city to find out how much it would cost to buy it. And I basically put in an option for that building with not necessarily a clear idea of what I was going to do with it yet, but it was a, the option didn't cost me much. So I thought it was worth it. And I went looking for partners to help me develop it into what I thought could be Um, uh, it was, it's almost half a million square feet. So it's big. And it was a hospital built first in 1904 and added on parts. And so, uh, it was a mess, but it was, um, uh, it was a great building to build what we're building. So it's a multi-use, um, campus. It's going to be three parts. The first part is offices for nonprofits, uh, with all kinds of shared and collaborative, uh, services in the building, especially, um, uh, uh, things to help develop the people in your on your staff, a capacity building. 
Um, the second phase is apartments, uh, 150 apartments for affordable apartments for teachers, nurses, social workers, public health, public safety, those people that make 35 to 55 want to live in a cool place. And then the third part, which will come in a few years, I'm hoping it was the nursing school. So it's really a school. I have this idea. I, maybe it's crazy. Uh, to create a campus of early childhood centers on one campus where they could share the gym and share the cafeteria and share the parking lot and not have to pay for all that space, but they could be different schools within the building and parents could decide which floor they want to enroll their children in, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and we could probably hold a 400 children, not in any one school, in any one classroom, still classrooms, you know, teacher classroom uh, student ratio could be 10, 10 to one or whatever, 10 students, one teacher to 10 students, but they would be multiple choices for the parents in a neighborhood that instead of saying you can only go in this school because if you live here, you could actually bring people together across those dividing lines um, together so that children could go early, 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 early childhood, baby, um, start being in diverse um, communities and getting to know each other in a way that they might not be able to today. Um, and allowing the people that work in our building also to send their children there, which oftentimes doesn't work with city politics and city delineations of school districts. But that's still a dream. Um, it's a good dream and it's becoming you know, harder in my head than it was before since um, President Biden is talking a lot about care and what does care look like in the 21st century. And I am um, you know, determined to have an impact on that in some way, shape or form. I love it, and the, the questions are coming in, but I, but I want to be mindful again of your time. One, I'll try to get in a couple. What are resources would you recommend to entrepreneurs? I mean, you started 48 years young, but to your point, lots, not the same amount of resource. Everything, there was no, you know, everything couldn't be Googled. Everything wasn't a template. Back to basics. What are the three things you think entrepreneurs just need to have to be able to grow their businesses? Well, as I said before, curiosity. Almost mm -hmm. every city has a university or a community college. There are resources there that want to help and students that are really smart and would help with business plans and help with marketing ideas and make use of those resources. Number one, you're, you're helping yourself, but you're also helping those students engage in real time work. Um, I use a lot of students, especially on the Del Mar Divine Project. Uh, they've been incredibly helpful. Um, the other is to... Um, you know, when you meet somebody, you know, at, and you get their business card, follow up. I, I give my business card out to everyone and you're welcome to give my email to anyone that you want to. How few people actually use it. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, I'm, I'm approachable person. You are. And, and I think most people really appreciate, um, you know, being that you think that they might have something to add to your life. But I also think the one thing I tell everybody is if you've gone to college or a community college, the first thing you should join is your alumni association. Mm -hmm. Because when somebody sends me a note and says, oh, I'm a graduate of the University of Georgia, I always pay attention to that. Because we have sort of a connection right away, um, even if I, they're you know, 20 years different in age from me. Uh, and I've met a lot of young people that way. So I'd say that um, they're right in front of you. The, the tools, as well as the ideas, are staring you in the face. You just have to make use of them. They don't cost anything. They really don't. The university almost always will make those resources available for you. And take those entrepreneurial classes, enter those entrepreneurial uh, contests, show up at those demo days and see what people are, they're almost always open to the public on college campuses and see what other entrepreneurs are doing and get, learn how to do a pitch. And it, it's, it's probably um, always free. Uh, and then if you had to start a business today, what would it be? I think I would start an early childhood center. And my dream is to think of all children as gifted but not because they're born gifted, because they have their gifts and we have to help them find their gifts yeah. because the future is our children. And if we don't help them from day one, magnify their opportunities, we will be way ahead of China if we do this. If we don't, we're gonna be behind because as you know, in China, children can read fluently Chinese at age three and English pretty well at age five. And by age eight, they're fluent in English. And so are pretty fluent. And we aren't necessarily literate at end of third grade, we all have less than 50% of all children um, can read proficiently at the end of third grade in the United States. So I think it would be something uh, um, around early childhood education and helping us find, um, bring out those gifts in all children. Got it. And then we have a very tactical one. You talked about trademarking the heart, which I love it. Um, we, a lot of entrepreneurs have ideas. When do you know it's time to start protecting it? That's a really good question. One of the things I learned working for the May Company was about brands and trademarks, not so much from what we May Company did, but from the mistakes we made. 
like trying to copy a Nike swoosh or, you know, we in, they send you a cease and desist pretty quickly. So I learned about trademark uh, law and I, from making mistakes. And so I vowed I would not do that. So every single, I overspent on it. I would not advise to do what I did, protecting way too many trademarks that we probably didn't need to protect, but it, it did serve us well. The heart Putting the bear, the heart in the bear is a, is a trademark. Obviously, Build a Bear Workshop is a trademark, and our logo type was a trademark, and many, many things. But they they did keep us. I think it did scare away some competition mm. um, because if they looked at it, they they saw that we didn't. One really brilliant thing that I did. I, I think it's one of the smartest things I did. You know, when when originally when Build a Bear started, we were literally sewing up the back of the bear, literally with a needle and thread. And we saw the lines backing up. We couldn't really do it. And also people were pricking their finger with a pen. You know, not most people. We had 13 people sewing bears one day at the gallery. We had to find another way. So we invented this. We thought we invented the system, this pre-lacing system in the factory. Hmm. But about, um, we filed the patent. And then we got a letter that a company um, had filed the patent a week before, a, a similar uh, idea for a patent uh, two weeks before us. And they got the patent. So I called them up on the phone and I, uh, I wanted to buy the patent from them. And they said, oh, you can't afford this. And I said, how much is it? And they said, $750,000. And I went to my, I had the money and the, we had the money. I said, well, we'll have to do it, take it away from something else, but we're going to buy that patent. And we ended up buying it, paying them out over several years, but wow. we've sold over 200 million stuffed animals. So that $750,000 was nothing. I mean, it's infinitesimal. And sometimes you think of something in a short term, it seems like a lot. But when you think about your brand, the same way for all the branding that I did, I spent, I hired a really professional person to help me with the branding. I'm not an artist, help me do it. And it was the best money I'd ever spent. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have to pay her all at once. I got to pay her over time. I got to pay for that. So, so there's ways to think creatively because yeah. you want the best and you want to protect your business. And it, there are ways to do it. You just have to be willing to think about it, not put it out of your head. It's too much money. I can't do it. Dream the dream supreme. I always say that. I love that. So, so I'm going to try to squeeze one more in. Who were your first hires? We get this question all the time when people start making money and, and you've been very clear. It took a team of people. So who were like the first and second people you hired? The first person I hired was a woman to help me with my marketing. She'd been in retail. She'd taken off um, 15 years to raise her kids. Okay. And she at least had a, re she was my like chief of staff person. Okay. Second person, a couple of weeks later was my CFO. I, I am smart enough to know what I don't know. And I needed a CFO and Tina was my CFO. Um, she retired like two years after me. We're best. We're still very close friends. I, I wouldn't make a financial decision on anything today without uh, asking her. And um, she really was, um, it was the smartest decision I made. You have to know what you don't know. And you have to be willing to pay those people more than you would even think of pay. I didn't even pay myself at first. Wow. I paid the people that needed to augment me because I did not have the answers to those questions. Wow. Well, I want to be so respectful of your time. Um, I, I think when I look at all the questions, I hope we can get you to come back. But um, just so people know, we had one conversation. I sent you an email and I said, can you do this? And you said yes. So I'm almost scared to give out your email, but you respond. You can. No, oh, you can't. You. Thank you for that. Um, thank you so much. You have been, you know, just just a note when you said you went public and we, we kind of went over that. Only 20 women have taken their companies public ever. So I am just tremendously honored and humbled that you joined us. I'm grateful for the work that you thank you so much. Uh, we will definitely have you back. Uh, but again, thank you so much for your time and for your entire team who made sure that we, we got you here. So, so thank okay, you. Great. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to see you today and to yes. spend my time with you. I'll, I'll be back in touch with you. And, and okay, before we leave, if you remember, uh, Maxine talked about the importance of customers. And so at 1863, we want to have the conversation and to make sure we equip you. So I'm happy to say that Manny, who is our amazing guy, uh, has developed a customer development toolkit. So every single one of you who has joined us will receive in the email right after this event, a de customer development workbook that will help you understand the different segments that you're targeting and the pain points they have all to ultimately elevate your brand's communication strategy. So this is a chance for you to take what Maxine has talked about and actually put it into practice. So I can I get a copy too? Absolutely. You, you absolutely. Because right. I know you're going to start something new soon. So absolutely. So right, I want to thank you for coming, Maxine, so much on a Thursday afternoon. I want to thank everybody who joined us. I hope that you found this useful, most importantly, inspirational and educational. Uh, be on the lookout for more of these town halls and fireside chats. And again, Maxine, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome, Melissa. It's wonderful. I had a great time. 
Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to Philip and the Kaufman Foundation for making this all possible. Ade is going to take us out with a little more music, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the month, the rest of the summer. Stay safe and stay sane. Thank you so much. <laughs>